I'm Cole Chandler, co-director of Colorado Village Collaborative, and this is the title of my presentation. So now, if it's ready. So given the title, I have to admit that I got started thinking about tiny homes uh, from a slightly different angle than the one I'm approaching the issue from these days. If you're wondering who this handsome, silver-haired man is with a slight resemblance to me, it's <laughs> my uncle, and that is a literal tiny home in his literal backyard uh, that I helped him begin to build back in 2012. I learned the basics of construction working on that project alongside of my uncle Blake, and he gave me this book to read as we worked. The book and my uncle's approach to the subject was an approach based in living simply and relying less on the large economic forces of corporate real estate, extractive energy, and the constant need to consume and accumulate more and more. In 2014, I moved to Denver and became friends with this guy. This is Marcus Hyde. He's one of the founders of Denver Homeless Out Loud. And Marcus was starting to work on another application of the concept. What if tiny homes could be built as a housing solution for people experiencing homelessness? The concept was simple. We're in the midst of an aff a housing affordability crisis and people are being criminalized for having nowhere to sleep. What if we built small, cost-effective homes quickly and shared common spaces for kitchens and bathrooms and showers where people could live together and build community while they worked with support to transform their own lives. Over the next several years, Marcus and his colleagues at Denver Homeless Out Loud worked to build support for this idea. It was hard work, and it took a lot of throwing rocks to get people's attention. But eventually, their work began to encourage people to imagine a new possibility for housing the massive numbers of people living on the streets. In 2017, this effort gained serious traction. Thanks to the efforts of the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado and the Urban Land Conservancy, we had land available. Thanks to some strong advocacy and political will, we found a zoning pathway. And soon enough, thanks to the generosity of many of the people in this room, we had money and volunteers to build a village. On July 21st, 2017, the beloved community village opened and 12 people who woke up on the streets that morning had keys to their very own homes. It was an amazing day, and my friends from Denver Homeless Out Loud and Interfaith Alliance and Bayod and Radian and Whiting Turner and the Buck Foundation and more all watched with joy as people moved from their camps into their own homes. Suddenly, 12 people had homes, but the work wasn't over yet. We still needed to know if this crazy idea would even work. Would it produce po any positive outcomes? Over the next several months, the University of Denver studied our pilot project, asking what were the impacts of the village on individuals, the organizations involved, and the surrounding community. The initial individual impacts were positive. We were housing people who were previously underserved by the existing shelter system, and these people were staying housed at a retention rate of nearly 90%. They reported an increase in satisfaction, a decrease in anxiety. 11 of the 12 uh, residents were employed or enrolled in school. The individual impacts were amazing. So living in housing is better for a person than living on the streets. That's not rocket science. But what was the Im impact of this intervention on the surrounding neighborhood? A random sampling of 20 neighbors were surveyed on the impact of the village on traffic, safety, noise, and sense of community. And the results were positive as well. Nearly 80% of people approved. And then there's this question of crime, which is not a question that we ask when young white millennials with man buns move into a neighborhood, <laughs> but it is one that we ask when people experiencing homelessness do. And the, Im the impacts of crime are positive as well. So we, we've experienced success with one pilot project that has housed 19 unique people and now transition five people into permanent housing. But the million dollar question is, can it scale? And is it the most effective use of our time, resources, et cetera? In the midst of a difficult effort to relocate the beloved community village to Glo Globeville earlier this year, a CPR uh, article asked whether or not this model was a city-sized solution. So we know that this model won't, won't work for everyone, but we think that it's an important uh, model for a segment of the population. And that real number that we're focusing on is the 1,300 people that are currently living on the streets because they have barriers to accessing the existing shelter system. Uh, because they're couples, they're LGBTQ people, they're people with pets, people with disabilities, people who are working, who just need a better option for themselves. Rhonda was one of these people. She lived in a, she had a pet. She lived along the banks of the South Platte River. She came to help build the village every single day during the summer that we built it. By October, she had moved on into permanent housing and became our first resident to move through. Ray is another individual, a veteran, who lived on the streets on 
on and off since he was a teenager. He hadn't had an ID in 30 years. He moved into the village, he, had, he gained an ID, he got employment, and he moved on into permanent housing in about 14 months. So that CPR article that I referenced earlier, uh, there were some, some experts who were quoted suggesting that tiny homes just don't make sense. Why don't we just skip the tiny houses altogether and put people in permanent housing right away, asked one expert from New York City. And then we already have the success we're yearning for instead of having people wait a year to get there. But the reality is that we can't build housing fast enough to do that. People are already waiting a year and more. Ironically, for some of the same reasons that I found myself originally interested in this subject, maybe tiny homes do make sense. Simplicity, attainability, speed, lack of reliance on big infrastructure. Tiny homes aren't competing with permanent supportive housing development for money. We're not going for tax credits here. We're not buying up land. We're finding a way to leverage local land and local dollars and turn those assets into a solution that reflects our contemporary values. In the 1980s, the federal government defunded housing and local resources stepped up to produce giant homeless shelters. These reflected the best, most compassionate thinking of their time. And it's not time that we throw these out, but it is time that we lean into something new and imagine new possibilities for ourselves. Solutions that produce the kind of outcomes that we want right now for our brothers and sisters that are living on the streets. We named this village the Beloved Community Village, placing it within the tradition of the Civil Rights Movement and the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. MLK's vision was for a world beyond hunger, homelessness, poverty, and war. And the crazy thing about that was that MLK actually believed that that vision was attainable here on the face of the earth right now. We believe that too. And if we lean into what President Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, I believe that we can attain this vision here now among us. Thank you.